Hello and welcome to episode number 278 of the Art and Show podcast, where we have science, we have creatives, we have all kinds of different content you can learn. It can be entertaining. We are here. On this episode, who do we have? We have, we have not had a dentist on the show before, and not just a dentist, but a different kind, slightly, of dentist. Dr. Joseph Sarkisian, biological, holistic dentist in the same area I am in, Los Angeles. This is a wonderful thing. Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. We are both Armenian, which is wonderful. Let's bring in a little bit of background. I am Armenian from Iran. Where are you from? Tell us a bit about your background. Well, I was born in Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, not Cyprus, California. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think I'm from Cyprus, but I'm from Cyprus, the island in the Mediterranean. Uh, of course, the Greek part, because it, it's a... Uh, it's a sep you know it's two parts now the northern part belongs to um it's an it's a independent or semi-independent uh uh country that that has been occupied by the turks so it's an occupied section of cyprus and uh of course we also lost uh, a couple of homes there my grandparents and my parents uh so almost every armenian on cyprus has uh you know a, a part of their property occupied by the turks but uh yeah, that's where I come from. And I also attended the Melkonian School, which is a very reputable um, boarding school um, that a lot of uh, Middle Eastern Armenians know about. Um, and so I'm, I'm proud to say that, you know, I got a little bit of our Armenian heritage uh, thanks to that school. That makes sense. It's cool to have our background. Now, you tell us what countries you've been in up until now and how you progressed through that. Ooh. Well, I've been around because, you know, my dad was um, employed by the United Nations. So uh, I've been, um, I've traveled quite a lot, uh, to either to live with them or to visit them uh, throughout the Middle East, uh, you know, crisis areas like Jerusalem and Beirut and uh, Egypt and all the way to Kashmir. Um, actually, I lived in Kashmir for two years. That's northern India. Uh, beautiful country, by the way. And uh, of course, they're really not in Indian per se, but they're more like a Indo-European race. That they're very, they're very beautiful. They're very um, nice and uh, you know friendly. And um, it's, it's it's a Himalayan country, so it's a it's got this natural beauty. Um, and so I'm I'm glad that I spent a couple of years there. I was quite young. Uh, and then I came back to Cyprus, where I, you know, went to the boarding school while uh, the rest of my, you know, family was like circulating throughout the Middle East. Yeah. Um, and then after boarding school, of course, you know, I I, I came to the United States for my undergrad. Um, I went to Alabama, and I just randomly went there to do my pre dental program. And uh, before I finished. Uh, my studies there, I kind of realized that I'm too far away from Europe. And plus, I had to do another four years to go to dental school because, you know, as you know, in this country, it's, uh, it's almost eight years, uh, approaching nine to just become a dentist. Whereas in Europe, um, it's generally between four to six years. So I had a friend in Germany and he said, why don't you come here? And uh, I said, cool, I'll Try it out and said, oh, yeah, we, we have to le learn the language. Uh, okay. So the last couple of years uh, in Alabama, I, I took some German courses and, and I started applying. And uh, I finally got in into Dusseldorf, uh, you know, Western Germany back then. I uh, did my, the, the last semester of my intensive German course. Uh, I was very excited because, you know, after Alabama, it was a big... A shift in you know environment and culture and it was like going to a different world you know and um, but I loved it I mean all that you know culture and a, a totally different challenge for a youngster like me like I was in my early 20s and uh, I had to tackle a lot but I thoroughly enjoyed it I don't I don't regret a moment of my dental school in Germany. Um, so I got admitted uh, 
in Göttingen, that's the University of Göttingen in, uh, in West Germany back then. And um, I did another four years of dental school. And, um, and then I, I got married and I moved back to Cyprus. I had eight years of, um, you know, my, my, the first eight years of my career were in Cyprus. I had a practice there. My children were born there. And then I decided to move back to uh, the U.S. Yeah, it, it, the island mentality was a little too small for me. You know, I, 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 had, to, I had to spread out my wings. And uh, especially being in the holistic field, I liked, I, I liked the, I was a little more ambitious. And of course, there were a lot of opportunities here. And of course, as you know, Los Angeles is like one of the big centers of naturopathic medicine and dentistry and all that so um so that's where i am now that progression through a variety of countries that's wonderful yeah. what would you say would you pick out any countries that had the most impact on you um where i lived yes i could say well you know i, I look at cyprus as my birthplace and it's always been this uh, place where you feel at home, even though we're Armenian, you know, they're Greek, but they have embraced the Armenians and they have given us safe haven uh, ever, you know, since the genocide. And it's a really nice country, very simple and very uh, hospitable people. And uh, every time I go back, I feel like I'm back at home, you know. Um, but apart from that, I, I really loved it in Germany. Um, I mean, Germany has this uh, discipline and this cleanliness and uh, structure that, you know, is really good for someone who's, um, especially a student, you know, who's trying to get the foundation um, in life and, you know, just gives you structure. And I think I learned a lot from Germany. And of course, it's a beautiful country. Um, but other countries that I've been to, uh, my favorite has been Ireland. That's, I can say that, you know, it's like my favorite country ever to visit. So and why is that? <laughs> well, because they're really absolutely, I mean, a, a beautiful country, very green and very lush. And, and the people are amazingly friendly. I mean, they kind of remind me of, you know, of Armenians in, in a sense. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I loved Ireland. It's like I had absolutely no trouble there and we mingled and the food and the pubs and uh, the, the people and the music. Yeah, everything was nice about Ireland. That's cool. Uh, I have a friend, Mary, in Scotland. I like Scotland as well. So that region has Scotland. a nice feeling. I visited Scotland after Ireland and uh, the scenery is amazing over there. Mm -hmm. Scotland is beautiful. Yeah. And all that. People fly there from far away just to be free. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Now, it's nice. The, the country, I look at a lot of places now where people have gone. The world is becoming much more connected. Africa is growing. There's a lot of variety on the planet now. But back to dentistry. What percent of dentists would you put in the category of holistic dentists? And how would you describe it at this time? What is it like being that? A lot of people ask me what the term holistic means. Uh, it's, it's a kind of a vague term. Um, someone who uses a slightly holistic approach maybe may call himself or herself holistic. But in general, holistic, I think every doctor and every dentist in the world should be holistic in the sense that you have to respect the whole body, not just compartmentalize it. Uh, you have to respect what you're placing in that body and how you're treating it. And basically um, the, uh, the, the whole idea of not causing harm, you know, and that's one of our main, uh, you know, founding principles uh, that anything you do to your patient has to uh, avoid harming them. But it's not that easy in modern life because now we're so 
bent on pharmaceuticals, which cause a lot of harm, but then we want quick fixes. So there's this uh, constant uh, tug of war between mainstream medicine or dentistry and holistic uh, therapies. But it's also very easy to be holistic just by considering what kind of approach you're taking in before you heal someone, whether it's their teeth or, your bo or their bodies or anything. Um, and there's a lot of modalities. So calling someone holistic implies that maybe they're using more oriental medicine or maybe they're using more uh, herbalism or naturopathic principles or even home remedies in that for that matter you know they are all considered within the holistic field but you have to also see what you're trying to achieve in somebody's um in, in the health of and in the, in the outcome of somebody's health or their teeth um, as far as teeth are concerned we still have to numb the patient because we don't want to hurt them, right. but we want to numb them in a way that we don't excessively um, pollute their bodies with the drugs like uh, the anesthetics, which are considered uh, a local toxin. That's why it's a numbing agent because it's a toxin. <laughs> it's like Botox, <laughs> but it, you know, it acts on the nerves. So, so you have to respect the tissue when you're injecting someone. Uh, you have to minimize the need for uh, painkillers. You have to try to avoid medications such as, you know, uh, antibiotics or, um, or uh, you know, painkillers that are uh, detrimental to your liver or to your, uh, to your mind. And most people who avoid medication I find that they heal faster. So, but how, how can you avoid, uh, or how can you find a replacement? Uh, there are a lot of remedies made from plants uh, that can be used instead of antibiotics. Uh, you still have to resort to antibiotics, and that's the wisdom of being a holistic practitioner, to when to resort to medication. And it could be, um, you know, let's say you have, an, a, a serious infection with fever and it's very close to the brain so you immediately have to you know that you have to give them antibiotics but if you're just doing a tooth extraction and you're just giving antibiotics just for the sake of it you know just to prevent a complication then in general that's not very good not only for that person because it upsets the whole system of the patient there uh, you know the gut flora and everything else just gets uh, all messed up but it's also contributing to the general problem we're experiencing in the world around the world by creating these super bugs and uh, we see that in hospitals I think there are more people dying from these uh, hospital related diseases because of these super bugs than any other disease you know so we have to respect that in a, in a broader sense. Uh, as far as holistic, um, again, I myself use a lot of homeopathy, which isn't really herbalism, but it has to do with vibrational remedies, extreme dilutions of substances that, that cause the body to heal uh, or to take a pattern of healing so you're influ influencing the body to heal. And I don't use metals. We don't use uh, mercury containing products. And to remove amalgam or mercury containing products, we take extreme precautions. I think among holistic dentists, that's one thing that really connects us all. That's the common denominator that we don't use mercury and we try to avoid root canals and uh, we we don't encourage any metal in the body. That makes sense. I mean, in a nutshell, you know. <laughs> it sort of sounds like instead of running more on autopilot, like this is what happens, so this is what we do, there's more thought to it, such as is there a way that isn't as painful? Is there a way that isn't as 
causing of long lasting damage in some form. There's like more thought than just it's this kind of procedure, we should do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. there's a lot more consideration and a lot more thought, as you said, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, and it's just that there, no, it's also the, the, the idea of uh, respecting the patient and doing what's absolutely necessary. Uh, we, are, we are driven by insurance these days. And uh, I'm proud to say that ever since I, I started my private practice, I've never contracted with any insurance. And I totally rely on my judgment and what's best for the patient rather than what's best for the insurance or what pays more or most from the insurance. So that's, uh, and that's what really, uh, you know, patients sometimes appreciate, even though they may pay a little more out of their own pocket, but it's uh, a lot safer for the body because I do what's right for the patient and their welfare. Now, going back slightly, so you have your own practice. How did you end up, could you have been any other sort of occupation if you're looking backwards? And then what has it been like having your own practice and what have been the challenges? Well, it wasn't that hard to choose, uh, you know, my career. It was just random. I didn't really give it too much thought, but I was always good for, with my with my hands. I, I was, you know, I'm artistic and, you know, I, I have another sight talent. <laughs> you must get to that so later, yeah. You probably know, but... Um, and also, I'm. I also like healing people. I like, you know, the the. the uh, I, I like to to interact with people, to help them, to make a difference. And I think working on teeth makes quite a big difference. Uh, you can actually see your results, and you you actually change um, the smiles of you know. Uh, from from day to day, you know, someone can experience such an improvement. Uh, or relief in in their dental situation, and which which make you know is very fulfilling as a, uh, as a matter of fact. And um, uh, as far as deciding or when I decided to become holistic is, as I said, I was I already always had the tendency to be holistic, but uh, it all started from the mercury question. Uh, the first year uh, of my private practice in Cyprus, I met this naturopath and he uh, immediately challenged me on the mercury issue. And I, I just ran this, you know, dogmatic response um, that, oh, you know, all amalgams are proven to be safe. Uh, there has been no um, uh, bodily harm ever, you know, attributed to mercury and blah, 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 whatever they uh, teach you, at, you know, in the dental schools. And then he introduced me to um, Hal Huggins' book, which opened up a lot of other uh, sources of, um, you know, the mercury issue, and uh, it completely made sense because you know I you you have to think outside the box, and if you if you look at it from um, outside your little comfort zone, then you'll understand that it's absolutely um, logical that mercury is not good for you, and you don't need convincing you know someone that you know, half of the mercury filling is actually mercury. It's not called the sil. It's called the, sil the silver filling because it's like a silver lining just to mask the fact that they have mercury. <laughs> so, um, so I just kind of switched to mer a mercury free practice. And, and on, uh, you know, parallel to that, then I just kind of learned more and more about homeopathy and every other aspect of holistic dentistry. Has there been any business-oriented challenges running your own practice, or has that been easier than not running your own practice? Anything that comes to mind in that category? Oh, it's just like running any other pr uh, practice. You you have to really depend on a good staff, uh, teamwork. Uh, of course, you have to um, balance your costs and your income. I mean, there's a lot of... Um, you you have to it's it's balancing the fact that you're a dentist on one on the one end and also a, a, a running the business on the other end so i think that's the biggest challenge that really every dentist has and uh you know a lot of dentists have their own managers and but then i like to have control over my 
every aspect of my business. So I don't want to grow too much. I have a nice sized office that, you know, I can, I can deal with, but I, I wouldn't survive in a franchise environment or in a big factory like dental setting, you know, where <laughs> it's like a conveyor belt dentistry, you know, yeah. but sense. I enjoy it. I wouldn't have it other, in any other way. That makes sense. One thing that came to mind is there's always changing moments over the years. What, is, what are some of the ways that the current moment is most different from 10 years ago as far as dental tools or what's available? Oh, dental technology is, is progressing at a fast rate. I mean, there's so much going on um, as far as, you know, <clears throat> social media and uh, digital dentistry and uh, even, even making crowns and bridges and implants. They're all uh, utilizing digital, um, you know, platforms. Uh, like the scanning technology, that's that's been the biggest um, uh, innovation in my practice. The CAD CAM technology, where uh, when you when you shape the tooth, you're instead of taking the impression, you're actually scanning it with a 3D camera, and then you're sending that um, uh, that image uh, to a milling unit, and then you're milling your own crown. And so you have absolute control over that aspect of uh, what you're putting in, in your patient's mouth. Um, also the 3D scanning as far as uh, CT scans that give you a 3D image of your bone. So we can identify a lot of uh, hidden infectious areas uh, around old root canals or cysts or the sinus, nose, jaw joint. There's so much you can see in a 3D uh, rendering of the scan than uh, than just with 2D X-rays, so that's that's been an absolute uh, blessing, really. I noticed you showcased quite a bit. It's wonderful because long live social media, and you have made videos showcasing methods or using a certain technology. How has that been valuable? Is it meant to showcase to other dentists or to potential? Patients, what are your thoughts on that? Well, a little while ago, you said that the world has gotten smaller because yes. we, 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 we network more. And so, uh, you know, a dentist can be viewing my Instagram posts from uh, Indonesia or Saudi Arabia or Greece or anywhere. And, and they, you know, it, it's like the world has, um, uh, you know, connected and it's kind of sharing what you're doing and, um, you know, and learning from others. There's so much you can learn from these little short posts, which are also, you know, are kind of not imposing. So you, you pick and choose. And um, I think it's very, very satisfying that you can post some little uh, pearl of knowledge that you have to others so that, you know, others can also be, um, uh, you know, exploit that. I like that quite a bit. The imposing is not imposing and anybody can put out little bits to connect to their life and yeah. somebody out there suddenly that's the solution to their day or their week or something they're working on. That's a cool feature, expression. And yeah, you know, I mean, uh, even though we have these strict uh, HIPAA regulations, uh, you know, uh, privacy and all that, but most of my clients, uh, even parents, uh, they don't mind me using clips or even if they're funny clips of their children, on my posts uh, because they're they're very open to it and as long as you know you don't have use names or you don't <laughs> disclose private data i mean and the children are just so um you know just fascinated by the fact that they're being used um you know and and they're getting you know getting to be the center of attraction for a few seconds so i think that's very encouraging you know it's like a little it's, it's like a place where you know even the children and their parents, they feel like they're at home and they, they have this trust, um, you know, uh, this trust situation with, you know, within my practice. Um, I think it's very important. And, and I like that. I, and that's why I see children a lot too. They, 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 they're the future. So when you're working with children, you're, you're, 
you're launching them in, into their future dentistry. And so if you give them a nice um, experience, uh, they will carry it on through, through their own, throughout their life. Um, so yeah, I'm sure every one of us, especially adults, you know, from the older generations, they, they have like these horror stories uh, coming from these brutal dentists. <laughs> so I wasn't like that, yeah. <laughs> right. I remember I had one. I remember that. That's a good point. Yeah. I can tell that I'm pretty good at uh, sensing people that you would be a good representative for people having a building a healthy foundation that feels good. So that's nice. Now I want to throw in some dental questions, some variety questions related to dental hygiene or related to that. One of them is interesting because I recently interviewed James Nestor, author of Breath. He's a, he wrote a book about breathing through the nose versus the mouth. Have you noticed any sort of impacts of people, like do you connect uh, whether people breathe through their nose or their mouth and how that affects their teeth or their face? Well, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I deal with this every day. Uh, the first thing I note on a child is whether they're a nose breather or their mouth breather. Wow. If a child is a chronic mouth breather, with my knowledge of craniofacial orthopedics, there's a cascade of problems that are going to happen in that child's life, including growth pattern deviation, uh, the jaws becoming smaller and more elongated, the nose closing up even more, the maxilla, the upper jaw being compressed even more. So the flow of air through the nose assures us, first of all, it, it, it strengthens the immune system and it um, produces nitric oxide, which is the hormone that is useful for you know, a good blood circulation, growth hormone, and a lot of uh, positive effects on the body. Uh, but it also um, causes a wrong posturing of the tongue, which creates um, uh, congestion in the mouth. So, and, and they're wrong. Actually, I have a friend here <laughs> who I'm going to show you and see. We have our friend here. This is wonderful. <laughs> so this is the upper jaw and look it has an arch form so if you're a nose breather this part of the nose this space will actually close up even more and the palate will rise up and this part will just be compressed as if i'm pushing inwards like this so that's what happens really because the lips are not together there's no lip seal the tongue is not resting on the palate so now the upper jaw is being pushed in by the force of the cheeks. So you're altering the equilibrium of the, of the mouth or of the uh, craniofacial structures. It's a very um, intricate equilibrium where if one force get, lets up, the other one overtakes. And that's what happens. Very interesting. Does that affect the actual alignment of the teeth or the color of the teeth or the, anything about the strength of the teeth or not really? Not the, not the intrinsic um, structure of the teeth, except, uh, you know, mouth breathers have a different makeup of uh, oral flora, the bacterial, um, you know, character changes, so they become more aggressive. So mouth breathers have uh, a higher risk of having gum disease or uh, dental decay in that sense. But as far as crowding, then of course, they're gonna be um, uh, suffering from crowding, which if not addressed before their uh, growth spurt is over, then it's gonna be almost permanent. Then you have to do 10 times, give, give the, you have to exert 10 times more effort in fixing that than if you had done it during their growth uh, phase, which is between seven and 11. Oh, that's the and peak growth most, phase. Yeah. So that's where you have to intervene. I see. So you, you can't wait until they're 13. 90% of the growth of the, of the skull and the jaws has occurred before 13. So what's 
what makes sense, you know, intervening during that period of growth or after. This is true. And that's why 80% of orthodontic patients have four healthy teeth extracted. It's usually these teeth because it's too late to make their jaws grow. So what's the next thing to do? Just pull the teeth, amputate teeth. It's almost like, oh, I don't have enough uh, space on my hand for my finger, so let's cut off two fingers. Or, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a very defeatist and, and very unbiological way to approach a problem. And these patients who have these teeth missing, they may have straight teeth for a while. But then when they hit 30, there's always going to be a damage. You'll see manifest manifestations of either sleep apnea, TMJ, uh, crowding all over again, and um, tooth erosions. I mean, there's always something wrong with patients who have extracted teeth who've gone uh, through braces. There's always some damage that will happen. And I see this every day. Huh. Right, that makes sense. You altered how things would have been. That's interesting. Now, one thing that comes to mind is this was a, I come up with the variety concepts. Let's say every single person brushed three times a day and flossed, let's say one or two times a day. I don't know what the exact amount would be and had good dental hygiene in that form. What would be the main other issues that would show up even taking care of things like that? Or is that a good chunk of where issues come from? So the frequency of brushing and flossing? Mm -hmm. Like if someone brushed and flossed a good amount and on time, uh, what percent of dental procedures would that change or how much is that the main issue? There's a wide variety of um, people who have a different, um, who experience a different risk factor for decay. There may be people who brush three times a day, but still may get more cavities than uh, those who neglect their teeth all day long and you know not even brush every day. Uh, but but it's the, the the both ends of the extreme, you know, like in, on, in general, brushing and flossing and healthy diet. And there's a lot of other factors, not only brushing and flossing. Uh, but diet is very important. Uh, nose breathing is also very important in this, and um, uh, and also genetics. So your hereditary makeup plays a big role in this too. Uh, I see a lot of parents bringing their children in with a lot of decay, and most of these parents are very health conscious. They're um, they avoid sweets and everything, and still their kids get cavities and. Um, I mean, there's uh, there's nothing else I can tell them except if you're doing everything uh, correct, then uh, it, it means that there's something that passed on from an older generation, like the genes, or even uh, in homeopathy, we call it a miasm. It's not directly gene-related, but it's a weakness that comes through uh, from generation to generation. And it's not gene related. It's, it's like a vibrational um, uh, weakness in your body. And that may be related to that too. There's also another factor about uh, the bacterium that causes dental decay. Uh, it's processing more and more foods because it's also mutating. So now you have the bacterium, which is called strep mutans. That's the only bacterium that actually causes decay. Uh, it's more aggressive and it's also it's not only breaking up uh, sugar as we know it but it's also breaking up other sugars uh, including uh, mother's milk huh. so mothers who nurse their children when they're infants and they have teeth and the mother's milk is pooling around the tooth I see so many cases of that happening where everything else is perfect, except the mother is a night nurser. So night nursing is not healthy, even if it's the mother's own milk, because it will rot. It will cause the, the, the what we call the bottle rot or, or a bottle decay, you know, baby bottle decay. Um, 
it's caused by the mother's milk. So we have to be careful, you know, as well, mothers have to be careful not to nurse late into the night and have the baby, you know, sleep with, with that milk pooling around their teeth. And it's out of experience, you know, I, I know that mother's milk is the healthiest thing ever you could give to a child, but um, I've, I've just seen so many cases and we have to put these three-year-olds to sleep to fix those teeth. And it, it hurts me, you know, to see these parents going through this dilemma of uh, trying to keep their children and their babies healthy, but on the other hand, their teeth are rotting. Right. That's another factor. On the flossing concept, can someone floss too much? Is there such a thing as like over flossing or is that not really a thing? I think you, 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 yeah, you can floss too much. You shouldn't floss too much uh, huh. because the gum, uh, the gum tooth uh, interface, it's very delicate. So uh, if you disrupt that repeatedly, and especially if you're very overzealous and you're just like shoving that floss into your pockets every second, then you're going to damage your, uh, the fibers of your gums. And when you have that damage, then you're getting more and more inflammation. So you have to do it very efficiently, gently, and um, just maybe once a day, maybe twice a day. How connected would you say that tooth health is to someone's overall health from what you've seen? So let's say their tooth health was at 60%. How close is that a link to their overall health? Like at 60% or something? Oh, now, you, now, now you're... You 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 opened up a nice uh, topic that I want yeah. to uh, <laughs> brush up on. So if you've heard of Weston Price, uh, he was a dentist in um, about a hundred years ago. Um, you know, like around like two thousand. Uh, no, uh, nineteen uh, in the nineteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. Mm -hmm. So he was a very uh, a uh, very smart dentist who noticed the connection between a healthy um, indigenous diet uh, and general immunity and general health. So he noticed that all the indigenous cultures in the world who ate their own food that wasn't processed, that wasn't uh, westernized, they had uh, large jaws, huge jaws, wide smiles, and healthy teeth healthy gums, and they had big chests, and they were healthy, they were immune, uh, their immune system was very strong, and, um, and even mentally they were healthy. Uh, and then he started comparing these cultures to those other tribes or cultures who had just been introduced uh, with the Western uh, processed foods and all that, you know, sugars and uh, everything else that we we eat these days and uh, and immediately he saw that the the children and the upcoming generations uh, from in, in those uh, communities had more dental crowding their immune systems were low they were having more chest uh, chest infections and there were mouth breathers and um, you know a lot of problems just from the diet issue um, so now, of course, uh, the, the issue about the, of course, we can't change that, you know, I mean, we can't live an indigenous lifestyle because uh, it's, it's virtually impossible, even though there are so many of us are now health conscious and we're trying, but um, we, we just have to transport, just transport yourself to pre prehistorical times where there's absolutely no um, industrialization, no even no farming or no processed foods, let's say 10,000 years. And just imagine what people ate then. Did they mix their food? Did they have a whole series of like, uh, you know, appetizers, appetizers and, um, you know, uh, rice and potatoes and meat and vegetables all over the place. So, did they have that? No, they had one type of food, right? Just yeah. one food. They caught a rabbit and they ate it and for a couple of days. Or, or they, they hunted, um, you know, like a, 
uh, a deer and they ate it. And, and then when there was no meat, then they started collecting grains and they ate the grains and everything was organic, but they never mixed foods. Uh, there was no uh, processed sugars at all. Um, and they were very active. They were very active. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and and they, they, they were chewing a lot too. That's another issue. When mm -hmm. you're chewing a lot, hard foods, fibrous foods, you're self-cleansing. The teeth are self-cleansing. Um, and there's a, a pattern of erosion, which is uh, healthier, even though we think that erosion is bad for you, but it's actually good for you in some sense because you know it cleans off all the um, all the even even the beginning decay spots are just ground away um, and then they had they had um, um, and then their eating habits also time wise they didn't eat constantly like we do like snacking mm -hmm. you know they they just ate whenever they were hungry really not not because they had to eat for social reasons or you know <laughs> every second we're eating because we're doing something or we're meeting up with someone or there's no occasion uh, but 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 you have to eat when you're hungry that's basically those are the basic rules you know um, that makes sense. It has consu consumer packaged goods are not the healthy thing that we were meant to be eating. And then a lot of people right now are intermittent fasting, which is not that different from eat a lot, just like they would do a long time ago, eat a lot and then have a break for some hours and then eat a lot as applicable, but not constantly forever, whatever product is available. Yeah. Yeah. One of the guys, uh, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, does intermittent fasting where he like doesn't eat for six, seven hours in the morning, and then he'll eat a big meal at night. Mm. It's a little extreme, but it's kind of related to what you're saying. Whatever works <laughs> for for people. This one was a curiosity in relation to complexity in your practice. One is one of the most complex procedures you perform, and how did you get good at that? Uh, it's um, you can say that it's implants uh, because for for almost twenty years, implants were uh, made from titanium or metal, um, and so most of my patients don't like metals. It's not that I convince them; it's just that when when they come to visit me, they're already um, you know holistic minded themselves, and they will not accept uh, metals. And if I if I were to put metal implants, then they would uh, leave me. <laughs> so, so I didn't place implants for 20 years and until zirconia implants um, were developed in Switzerland and Germany. And they were introduced in the US about 10 years ago. I immediately jumped onto them because, you know, every time my patients lost a tooth or you know, had to be missing so many teeth. Uh, the only thing you could do is either do a denture or a bridge. And I hated those things. So finally, I just jumped on it. And in order to place implants, you, you need some training and you need some, uh, you know, surgical knowledge, uh, which I had. So it was a little easier for me. But of course, um, in order to place an implant, you have to have a three-dimensional three um, diagnostic device, which we now have to know exactly where that implant is going. Is it actually going into the bone or into the gums or is it perforating out the other end? So there are lots of things that can go wrong. And um, by being very meticulous in your diagnostics and your surgical technique, um, you, you have a better chance of um, you know, success with implants. And it's been almost seven years now I've been placing the zirconia implants. Um, by the way, zirconia, uh, I'm just assuming that everyone knows what it is. It's zirconium dioxide, which is a ceramic. It's a very strong ceramic. Uh, we, we have heard about zirconia because of the diamond. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, the fake diamonds that are, you know, on, sometimes you see on rings, they're made out of zirconia, but that's the crystal form of zirconia. Uh, what we have 
is, let me show you. Dropped it a few seconds ago. So this is the, a larger uh, model of the zirconia implant. Oh. Okay, it's pure ceramic. There's no metal part to it. Oh. It comes in different forms. Uh, it could be uh, two piece, one piece. Uh, it could have an internal screw, which is also either made of uh, ceramic or uh, a carbon fiber screw. So we try to stay away from metals because inserting this, it's just like a screw really, and you're inserting it in the bone. And if you put something that is a metal in the bone, uh, metal acts as an electromagnetic, uh, you know, it has an electromagnetic field. Uh, it corrodes. It creates some inflammation in the bone that you may not feel, but it affects your different um, organs. And, um, and it creates tattoos in your gums because all the metal that's seeping out of here uh, will go into the bone and it'll, it'll surface on your skin, on your, um, on your gums. And, and it's also unsightly. So zirconia is white. It doesn't corrode. It, it's not a good conductor. It's an insulator. It has no electric activity, no magnetic activity. And so this is the only thing that holistic dentists will place. And I think this has been the most challenging, but also the most satisfying part of my practice ever since they were introduced. Uh, how much, how, one thing that makes, comes to my mind is how much do you have to interact with orthodontists in what you do? Is it common that you're maybe asking them a question or is your part separate from them completely? How connected are you to the orthodontic world? Well, I've been doing orthodontics for 20 years. Um, the only thing I don't approve of in orthodontics is taking out or amputating the four healthy teeth. Uh, otherwise, orthodontists have great skills. They have great training. I wish they could look at a person more holistically. And that's where we come to the holistic nature again of, of therapy. Because when you're taking out teeth, you're violating all biological principles. You're making the jaw smaller. You're making the airways smaller. You're opening up new problems for the future. So um, you're giving them straight teeth, but you're really ruining their lives. And that's one thing that really, actually it's one of the very few things, maybe even the single thing that angers me is when an orthodontist you know, uh, has four teeth amputated from a child because the child cannot make this decision. They're not an adult, they can't, and it's decided for them, but they don't realize what their life is gonna be like later on. That's why that angers me. I think it's child abuse. That makes sense. Yeah. Also, that points out that this is your area of care because somebody else might not be so angered, but the areas we have emotions connected to is where we should be because we're representing something there. And that's true. It's like you're thinking you can see it 10, 20, 30 years down the line and issues that could come up. That makes sense. Now that we have covered the dental world, I would like to include a little bit creativity. You have some creative outlets. I have indirectly known of you through your daughter and some of her poem and fiction material, a lot of creative outlet there. What has been your creative outlet over these years? Oh, my, my, my daughter is amazing. I mean, the, what she writes, uh, I, could, I, I can't even dream about, you know, writing as good as she writes, but um, I was always good with my, you know, with my art. Uh, I always drew, even as a child. I was always scribbling something on paper and sketching. And um, I, I just got better at it over time. And uh, it's, it's a nice, you know, outlet for me. And, um, I'm also, as you realized, I'm very, um, let's say, uh, patriotic. <laughs> so I love our history, our mythology. Um, actually, I like all mythology. And I love 
beauty and aesthetics. I love children. I love dance because dance is the language of the body. So uh, a lot of my art centers on those topics, you know, um, the innocence of children, uh, the, the, the beauty of, of dancing and dynamic, the dynamic nature of dancing, the dynamic nature of uh, our, our, you know, the, the, the mythology of different peoples. Um, my latest, you know, series has been the Pantheon of the Armenian Gods, where I'm trying to create some kind of a slightly different, uh, you know, depiction of each one of our gods. And not, not the, you know, cliche gods that we all know, but some of the lesser known gods that have just been kind of shrouded in the mist of our history. And I just want to revive them. And I, I also like the fact that there is, there has been a revival of our, uh, you know, our heritage and our history. Um, I like, I'd like Armenians to break free from the, um, from the stigma of genocide and just kind of grow and reach into, reach back into our history and revive our, our valor, you know, the different part, a different part of our being rather than being the victim, the victimized people just revive the valor of the Armenian nation. Um, and and that's, that's my goal. And, and I love to see that because I see a lot of that happening these days. Yes. I think about perspective and in relation to that, things like that, that when you come from the mindset of, well, these things happen to me, you're in this reactive point, and then all you can do is keep reacting, and the next year something happens and you're reacting, and you're never creating or producing or making your own way. Whereas if you think like, okay, that's part of good, that I'm glad that these things occurred, and so I can do my things and create and produce, the perspective is completely different because now you're free to go. The other one, you're just waiting for things to just keep pummeling you for years and years and years. You can't build that way. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the victim mentality, you know? Oh. All victims, you, uh, like any uh, uh, people who go through abuse through life, it's the same thing. You know, uh, they try to break free from it, but b because of their uh, mindset, they they keep uh, they, they just keep be, you know they be they keep being abused over and over again, and they can't break free. I think our nation has to break free and um, and just put. I mean, we can't forget what's everything that's happened to, you know, and anyone should remember or, or keep it. You, you grow from, from your pains, but um, you shouldn't pay, let your pains, you shouldn't dwell on your pains. That's what I'm saying. And, and I think by, by being creative, our, uh, we can progress into a higher state of uh, being by being creative, but also by, um, by putting emphasis on, on our roots, you know, uh, on who we are. You know, I was going to ask what a message you would have, what message you would have for all people of the planet, but pretty much, I think that was the message to all people of the planet. If so, it's a strong message, which is kind of cool because you came up with it before I even came up with it. What kind of, that's ahead of the game. This is wonderful. We have covered a whole variety of content there. The one thing I like is creativity plus your own thing and then messages. There's a variety there. Dr. Sarkisian, I would like to thank you for having been on this episode of The Armin Show. Thank you so much. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. I enjoyed it too. And we are out.